Hey, it's John. Welcome back to my channel. And today I decided to do a video for the Tim Travelers International Staycation Challenge. So today I'll be going to Austria. Now, to be pedantic, I said Austria, not Australia. In Austria, they've got animals like this. Or at least they used to. Austria is a country right in the middle of the European continent that straddles the largely inconsequential constructs of Eastern and Western Europe. Approximately 62% of Austria's landmass is occupied by the Alps, but as we'll soon see, the country isn't completely covered in mountains. Sort of. Austria really is a very beautiful country. Australia, on the other hand, is both a continent and a country, and I'm fairly certain you already know that. I only mention it because apparently there's so much international confusion about Slovakia and Slovenia being two completely separate countries, both of which happen to border Austria, that other countries routinely send official mail to the wrong nations. Anyways, wherever there's an abundance of pristine mountains, there's of course an abundance of wealthy tourists that come to ski. And while we're not here to focus primarily on skiing, as it is summertime after all, it's still fun to get a view from up in the air. While modern ski lifts are often associated with mountain ranges in Europe, such as here in Austria, some people would argue that they were actually invented by the Union Pacific Railroad in Omaha, Nebraska, but I'll let you argue about it in the comments below. Let's see what else Austria has to offer. The River Danube travels through Austria on its way from Germany to the Black Sea. I assume this must be a tributary or something. I must say, they have the strangest animals up here in the mountains. Austria looks a little different than I was expecting. The Bohemian Forest is another example of Austria's breathtaking scenery, although I don't know about the locals. Now you may be starting to think that I'm not actually in Austria, and to tell you the truth, I'm starting to wonder myself. But to give you indisputable, undeniable evidence that I am actually in Austria, Take a look for yourself. Here we have the infamous steam locomotive number 104, known as Riva. The locomotive gets its name from the town of Riva del Garda in northern Italy, where it was originally placed in service. This locomotive was part of a three locomotive order built by the Krauss Works in 1890 in Linz, Austria. They were built for a newly opened railway connecting the tourist towns of Mori, Arco, and Riva del Garda in what is today the Trentino region of northern Italy. In 1890, however, the railway was most definitely under the control of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The railway was only 24.2 kilometers, or 15 miles in length, and it was built to Bosnian gauge, which is 760 millimeters, or just under 30 inches wide. The railway hauled both passengers and freight between the three towns which contributed to the line's name. It served as a disconnected branch of the standard gauge Brennerbahn, which connects Innsbruck, Austria, to Verona, Italy. The steepest grade on the line reached 2.8%, so those 062 tank engines were definitely built for power and not speed. Now while quaint little mountain railways serving tourist health resorts are lovely and all, the Holy Kingdom of St. Stephen had other plans for this locomotive. See, on May 23, 1915, Italy declared war on the Austro-Hungarian Empire to, among other things, take back the region where the Mori Arco Riva Railway was located. Of course, the Habsburgs weren't about to let this locomotive go. Well, not without a fight, at least. The three locomotives were used on various Heritsfeldbahn, or army field railways that were hastily built to transfer troops and equipment. One of these railways was the Val Gardenia Railway, which was 31 kilometers long, or 19 miles long, and built in four and a half months. I guess you can do a lot with 6,000 Russian prisoners of war at your disposal. Anyways, World War I ended with the Austro-Hungarian Emperor deciding that while they had had a good run, it was probably time to hang up the beard oil, but not before more than two million people had died on both sides of the newly established Italian border. I know that this was basically par for the course as far as World War I goes, but that's an incomprehensible amount of casualties for a piece of land that's still relatively sparsely populated today. Now the post-World War I history of this locomotive is a bit murky because there's surprisingly little documentation of interwar industrial locomotive rail fanning, but I'm going to do my very best to give you accurate information. The Wikipedia article for the locomotive states that Riva was moved to Poland after the war to work on an industrial railway in the town of Stree. 
I believe this is technically true, but as the town of Stry in modern day Poland looks like this, I believe the locomotive actually went to Stry in modern day Ukraine. Stry, or Stry, is still an industrial town in western Ukraine and is home to a former steel mill and automobile factory, which may have been where Riva was operating. There aren't many narrow gauge railways in Ukraine, as the Soviet broad gauge is especially incompatible, but there was a curious former logging railway that traveled from the Romanian border at Terezva to forests in the modern Navirdna district. This line was built to a 750mm gauge and later converted to a 760mm gauge, which is the same as Riva. So I'm not saying this locomotive operated on this line, I'm only stating that other 760mm trains were operating less than 100 miles away, which is why I believe Riva ended up here, in the town of Stry, in modern day Ukraine. Now of course World War II ensured that this was not the end of the story. After operating in some capacity during the war, the details of which I couldn't find, Riva ended up south of the border in Romania. Kaya Ferrate Romania, or CFR, had a number of 760mm narrow gauge mining railways across the country. Riva ended up working on the line between Alba Giulia and Zlatna. The area around Zlatna had been the location of gold mines since the Roman times, and in 1782, an Austrian mineralogist discovered tellurium, so I suppose it's fitting that an Austrian built locomotive would eventually end up hauling minerals down the mountain. Riva worked on this line from approximately 1945 until 1968, when Zlatna ceased to be a workers' collective and regained its status as a town. The locomotive was then sold off to an Austrian company, Placer and Thurr and the narrow gauge line was eventually converted to standard gauge. So that almost brings us up to today. But of course I'm not actually in Austria. I'm actually at the Henry Dorley Zoo in Omaha, Nebraska. Yes, it turns out that this tiny tank engine wasn't finished emigrating just yet. As I said before, Omaha is where the Union Pacific Railroad is headquartered. This is of course because the first transcontinental railroad began construction across the Missouri River in Council Bluffs, Iowa. While well, the Austrian company Placer & Thurr specializes in construction of railway track and maintenance equipment, and their subsidiary, Placer American, does extensive business with Union Pacific. In 1974, an executive at Placer learned that the Henry Dorley Zoo was looking for another, more powerful locomotive, as the zoo's railway is quite hilly. Union Pacific then arranged to have the locomotive shipped from Austria to Omaha, where it was extensively modified. At the UP's former shops in downtown Omaha, the locomotive was converted from coal to oil firing and was equipped with American-style air brake equipment. A replacement bell and headlights were also fitted as they were previously missing. Riva is much more powerful than the other steam locomotive that the zoo operates, and for that reason it typically operates on the weekends when longer trains are warranted. The zoo's first locomotive, numbered 119, is a purpose-built replica of the original UP 119 that was pictured in the Golden Spike Ceremony in 1869, but for the purposes of this video, we don't care about that one. Since entering service at the zoo in 1976, Riva has been rebuilt twice as the zoo maintains a full-service steam shop. It has also been repainted to look more historically accurate, and it's an absolute gem in a part of the country that is seriously lacking in passenger trains. In fact, despite Nebraska, and more specifically Omaha, technically being the headquarters of two of the world's largest railroads, the Omaha Zoo Railroad is one of only four daily operating passenger trains in the state. While Nebraska is roughly the same size as both the Korean Peninsula and Belarus, the only other passenger trains in the state are the Battery Electric train at the Lincoln Children's Zoo and Amtrak's California Zephyr trains 5 and 6, both of which pass through the state in the middle of the night. Anyways, if you'd like to ride Riva or just visit the zoo in general, it's open daily from 9 to 5 in the summers and 10 to 4 in the winters. Admission is $26 for adults, $19 for children, and the train and Sky Fari tickets are not included with admission. Again, Riva generally runs on the weekends at the zoo, as higher crowds means they add cars to carry more passengers. The Henry Dorley Zoo is a truly world-class zoo, and I highly recommend it if you're in the area. The zoo is fully accessible, as is the train. In fact, the new platform at the Kennefick Station even features level boarding. Just keep in mind that the zoo is pretty large and hilly, so it might be fairly strenuous for some guests. There is, however, ample free parking. In fact, the parking lot is so big that you could almost put a baseball diamond in it. So I really hope you enjoyed this slightly ridiculous video. If you did, I would love it if you would check out some of my other videos because I have a lot of rare related content. If you want to see the Tim Traveler's original video, the link will be in the description. And as always, I will see you all soon.